Hello and welcome to another exciting episode of the weekly Shonen Jump Breakdown for the week of August 28th. I almost forgot what day it was. That's fine though. This is a really good set of chapters as we'll get into. But we start off with Food Wars 228. So remember how last week I was complaining about how we didn't get to see the actual like breakdown of why the other two of our crew lost and the other two of the Student Council won? Well... They go into it a little bit. We still don't find out what happened with Nagishima's there. Uh, Rindo just kind of wins. But, uh, you know, hey. Rindo at least respects what uh, Megishima did. And it brings her to the floor. So, hey. Good job, Megishima, I guess. Uh, you'll have to forgive me that I move my head around a lot. I'm trying to avoid the glare as much as possible. Until I can figure that out. We're still new with this camera. This is our second weekend. So, uh, yeah. Anyway... Mimisaka's trace was almost perfect. The only thing he was missing was experience. So, sure, okay, yeah. He hasn't had a lot of experience with sushi. Makes sense. I'll give it to Saito there. Um, there's no doubt with Tsukasa. Tsukasa's dish was superior to Kuga's. Um, the fact that it made them drop the spoon, the fact that it was four separate flavors that melded into one with the broth. It's like, of course, of course that was going to happen. Tsukasa is literally the best. So what can you do, you know? Um, however, in all that, we did get to see that the student council members, uh, specifically of the 10, were shaken by how tough that fight was. That Saito said it would take a couple days for him to recover, probably. Uh, Tsukasa even admitted that, yeah, he's not going to be able to participate tomorrow. And Rendo literally fell. So the loss wasn't for nothing. And it turns out that was part of the plan. To pit... Uh, Megishima and Mimasaka and Kuga against these three in the hope that even if they couldn't win, they could at least weaken them so that the others could come back in as a strike hitter. And that's what a team's for. And so then Tsukasa's realized this as well, and it like tries to, to goad Soma into not participating for the next couple of days so that uh, he can fight Soma again. And Yuki here is just like, nah, I'll, I'll fight tomorrow. I, I came to win as a team. So, you know, I'll, I'll be a part of things tomorrow. And so, you know, we have the first years going up tomorrow. And it's, as the bout ends, and the night, it's about to be over, Soma's like, should we go ahead and lay out the cards for tomorrow? Can we go ahead and do that? It's like, man, confidence! This man has confidence, and I am, I'm super okay with that. Uh, this is a really, really solid chapter. Looking forward to next week's. Again, I still wish we'd found out what it was about Megishima's ramen that wasn't as good as Rindo's dish. But I appreciate that they did at least show that Rindo was struggling from it, so. Oh, well, you can't get everything you want, right? Dr. Stone 24, though. Really solid chapter. Uh, Gin doesn't know which side he should be on. Should he go with Senku's side? Should he stay at Tsukasa's side? And uh, Senku's like, well, hey, we're about to have power. We're, I'm making a power plant, so, you know, get on our side. <laughs> Storm breaks out. Everybody's just... It's really amazing to me how quickly Senku's group sets into motion, since most of them have never done this before. Senku's a really solid leader, and it's kind of a shame that, you know, Tsukasa got the billing as the guy who could gather people to him, because that's exactly what Senku's done. But they, they get everything set up for this lightning rod, and they shove Ginro's spear into the ground to be able to do it, and the lightning strikes, and everybody's just shocked. And immediately Gin realizes that now they have a dynamo and Senku is going to be able to make all these different power related things using this dynamo if they can just keep doing this. Uh, eventually being able to, to set up a power plant. And uh, you just you get this really funny image of the, the harem in the hot spring in one bowl and the uh, ramen in the other bowl from earlier has been replaced by all these powered electronics, and it's just crushing the scales. Uh, it's a really solid chapter. I really enjoyed this. Gin being a magician and making the flowers disappear to trick magma. Like, that's, that's all really good stuff. And then, of course, you have uh, Senku telling Chrome that, hey, this is the result of the years of your work trying to get this this science set up. And it's like, yeah, it's, it's really powerful to me to see that Senku and Chrome have been able to bond like this where I was originally afraid it would kind of be like a, a really weird rivalry, they quickly become friends, and that's really cool. 
still want to know what's going on with Taiju, but eventually I feel like we'll get that story. I'm going to stop worrying about it as much until we get a little bit more scenes that is coming, you know? Good chapter, good chapter. One Piece 876. Big Mom is a street shark now. Uh, so, a lot happens this chapter. And I feel like a lot of times with the Weekly Shonen Jump Breakdown, we have very short chapters, and, and I can spend quite a long time breaking them down. But when we have a chapter like this where so much happens, I kind of just want to move through it. Um, you have Big Mom cutting her way through the ground to attack. You have putting foaming at the mouth when Sanji is talking to her. Sanji's making the cake. Roger's base had that down. Uh, and pudding is a hardcore tsundere. Like, give it to Oda that he never goes in half measures. When he brings finally brings a tsundere into the story, she is... Boom! To the point where she is calling Sanji dear every time she says his name. Like, a solid two panels after she says it, it feels like. Um, after she says his name. You have her forgetting that he's on the magic carpet with them and telling him he needs to get off and then being excited that he's on the magic carpet with him. She is a hardcore tsundere in classic One Piece style. Nothing can ever be the normal version. It's always got to be that to the extreme. Uh, and I, it actually makes me like her character a whole lot more than what I did in the past. I felt like Pudding was uh, flip-flopping a lot, but it didn't really feel like I had a good reason for why she was flip-flopping a lot. But now that it's very clear that she's uh, she's not all right up there. Uh, I like her a lot more because it's a lot better than just, hey, here you go. She's a traitor. She's not actually a traitor. That's the best part. She's not, She hasn't betrayed anything. She's betraying her own feelings. And that's great. I mean, she was originally, don't get me wrong. She was originally a traitor. She tried to kill Sanji. But now she's fighting her own feelings. And that, that feels a lot better to me than just, I work for Big Mom, but I'm going to help you, but I'm going to help Big Mom, but I'm going to help you. Uh, this just makes a lot more sense to me. I don't know. Maybe I've just seen too much anime. Um, it's also really nice to see her just have normal conversations with Luffy when she's not talking about Sanji. She's like, hey, this is the wrong way. You, you got to go the other way. There's a wall up here. The seducing Woods is tricking you. Go back. You know, your ship's this way. And uh, even, even Luffy's like, is this normal pudding? <laughs> it's, it's just great to see that she is still a character past that that quirk that she has um speaking of powers though see what I did there? <laughs> um man her devil fruit's useful it's just able to immediately remind like replace the memories that are currently occupying their brains with the ones from when they were in their original souls like their original bodies that the souls came from that's horrifying to me like you were a person who lived on totland and you you made some mistake and you got your soul ripped out of you, and you were put into a tree, and you've been living your life as a tree, and everything's been fine. And then all of a sudden, you remember that you were a person. It's like, whoa, man, that's the worst. There's what's up? One person's like, my brother hit me. It's like, what happened there? Is his brother dead? Is his brother still alive? What happened there? This is terrifying. So yeah, that that's real rough. But past all that, you have <laughs> Brooke and Chopper have been holding their own. Katakuri uh, seems a little concerned, just a, just a little bit. It's almost like he's looking into the future and seeing something that has him scared. And then Zeus is still thinking about the weather egg. He comes back to Prometheus. He's back with Big Mom. But it feels like he could very easily just switch sides again. Uh, for more of those those tasty black balls that Nami gives him. And that's all I'll say about that. Good chapter. Robot Laser Beam 22! Robo... He's doing exactly what I wanted him to do, which was to keep an eye on everybody else and try to learn, but he's doing it so much better than I thought he would. He's focusing on what, where they're placing their shots, how much power they're putting into their shots... And he is using that information to make his own shots and to improve his own score. He's being very reckless. He's putting too much power into his shots to try and make up for it. Uh, but the fact that he is doing that 
is actually really useful for the team. Just like kind of what happened with Food Wars earlier. If you have one team member do the crazy reckless thing, and in this case it was obviously uh, Magishima by spending all that time on the broth for Kuga, then it opens up the possibilities for everybody else to work. And so here where Robo is the one going crazy and being reckless, not going crazy, I guess, but being very reckless, uh, being very, very, I almost said out of character for him, but it's not. It's who he really is, and I love that. I can't wait for him to do what more. But because he's doing that, everybody else is able to just focus on their own golfing. And that means that you have everybody else just putting in work. Taking that deficit from a 7 to a 3. You get the Wedge Wizard striking again with the Ultra Marine Droplet. The Ultra Marine Droplet. Like always, it seems uh, a little bit crazy, but it does make some form of sense. It, I don't know how much speed the ball would have to lose jumping three times or skipping, I guess, three times across the water like that. But sure, I don't know the science on it, so I'll say absolutely that could happen. Maybe. Regardless, it looks sick. I can't wait to see the other five approaches because he's got seven, right? Man. I love Robot Lizard Man. Black Clover 122. <laughs> you know has a really good opening remark here about how fragile the elites are when they stumble. And I can't help but feel like that's him referencing how far he and Asta have come. And how much effort they've had to put in to do that versus some of these elites that were born into this and just, you know, have always done their thing the way that they have. And it really is telling to me that they're able to just... Sorry, the pop filter fell and made things interesting. Uh, it really is telling to me that they're able to fight their way up like this. And when Yuno makes this remark, I can't help but feel that you know, you know, it doesn't really trash talk. This isn't trash talk. This is him actually just remarking on, oh yeah, you guys really are fragile when you fall. Uh, because to be fair, his opponents over there are just like, it was supposed to be me. I was supposed to fulfill Master Machis' plan. It was for me to do. <laughs> and so, you know, you know, it, it almost... It's very strange when you have a character that doesn't trash talk that starts trash talking, but it, at least in Yuno's case, it feels it feels applicable, I would say. Because uh, again, I don't think it's that much of trash talking anymore of just where they've come from. However, <laughs> immediately after this, Yuno accepts a dessert from Charmy because he uh, feels like it's a good thing. He should probably eat after a match like that. And it's just like an arrow to the heart. Charmy just flips over backwards and lands on her back. It, it's too much for her. She can't take it. For Prince Charming paying attention to her like this, she, she can't take it. Uh, first bounce over. Time for the second round. So the field has to change because this is a tournament art. And that's how it works. Uh, I really like that Xerx had set up traps ahead of time. Uh, it fits the little bit of his character that we've seen so far very well. I feel like it also fits Asta's character to be like, no, it's, that's not fair. You got to play by the rules. So it's just like, well, there's no rule against it. So, you know, what's wrong with it? Uh, also, Mimasa and Asta trying to argue with Xerx is really adorable in my opinion. I've not been a big proponent of Asta and Mimosa. I'm not a big shipper when it comes to Black Clover. Uh, just because there's too many options, I guess, for a lot of characters. Um, but... When, when Zerx calls him a little idiot and asked us like, I'm not little and I'm not an idiot. And Mimosa's like, well, you are small, but you're not an idiot. And Asta's like, Mimosa, why? It's, it's, it's adorable. It's really good. There needs to be more interactions between characters like that, in my opinion, in the series. Because uh, it fleshes out those characters. As Before that conversation, I still viewed Mimosa as just Asta, woo. Whereas now I'm like, okay, so she can tell Asta he's wrong uh, in specific things if she wants to. Uh, Curse is still great. He sets up his magic. Asta uses the witch's powers. 
use the Black Hurricane, spreads out all the petals and cuts through them, and Xerxes is super mad about his traps. Of course he is. He, he wanted those traps so bad, and he was already upset they got moved, and now they're destroyed. I'm not exactly sure why the Black Hurricane destroyed the trap. I guess they maybe they're magic traps. I guess they'd have to be. Uh, that makes a lot of sense, actually. I revoke my uh, contemplation there. But yeah, it, it's just, it changes the whole layout of the field immediately, because now we don't have Xerxes' traps in play, and Kirsch's magic has basically been dispelled. So, the real fight will start next chapter. Uh, Xerx and Mimosa both seem shocked when asked to use the witch's magic, which is really interesting to me. I feel like, I don't know if it's, for Mimosa at least it was probably shocked that Asta was doing that. For Xerx at least though, why did that surprise him? I don't know, I feel like there's there's more to Xerx than we know. Because he didn't really react to the magic of his enemies last time. He was just, like, laying out while they were doing things. And he reacted to this one. So, who knows? We'll have to see. We never learned 28. So, this is a weird chapter for me. I always feel like I'm defending We Never Learned. This is a weird chapter for me. Because I like it. I do. It's ridiculous it's completely ridiculous and i normally would put my foot down and say this is this is a step too far uh but i enjoyed it at the same time some like we never learn is really good about setting up situations that you go oh of course whereas in this one it's not there's never a moment of oh of course that person's there oh of course that person's doing that because it just feels like oh okay well yeah that person's here i guess um Specifically, Uiga has to fill in for his mom because she's sick, and he's working in this lingerie store, and he's in a mascot costume, and that's one of those, oh, of course, because you can't have him interact with the girls in this setting with his regular outfit. He can't be seen as himself. He has to be seen as somebody else. Uh, but you then immediately follow that up with Takamoto and Ogata. It's like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Um, they are the, for the lack of sounding pervy, they are the... Uh, more endowed characters, uh, so it makes sense that they would be there getting some lingerie. Uh, granted, any it could have been any of the girls, but sure, why not? It's all right. Uh, it's got to be somebody, so sure, those two. Uh, they remark that Furuhashi's not there, and that's a shame. And then Yuiga has to <laughs> Yuiga has to measure Ogata's bust size. Because they've grown and she doesn't know what size she needs anymore. It's like, okay, sure. Yeah. All right. He's he's working here. He's in the mascot costume. That's, I'm assuming, something the girls have to do. Uh, I've never worked in a lingerie store before, but I'm assuming that is. So, sure. Okay. He clearly doesn't know what he's doing. Takamoto helps him out. And then uh, they get all taken care of and they leave. And there's a really like cute scene where Yuiga is desperately trying not to to care about how big Ogata's uh, breasts are. And then when Takamoto says the actual size, um, Ogata has to grab a hold of the counter uh, to calm himself down uh, because he is still a man. Um, also, I do want to clarify that he did have a moment where he was going to try and let him know it was him. He wasn't just doing all this, but he couldn't reach the zipper. I still feel like he could have been like, hey, it's me. I know his voice was muffled in the mascot, but I still could feel like if he was super uncomfortable with it, he would have been like, Hey, it's, I know you can't really hear me, but I'm trying to take this off. Please help me. Uh, and they would have done it. Because uh, Takamoto's a nice person. She would have done it. I don't know about Ogata. That's, I don't know. Reserve might not have helped. Regardless, they leave. Uh, Kurisu is there. And her bra strap is stuck. She can't undo the clasp. I don't know why she's there. I mean, I, she's obviously there to buy lingerie. But my point is, uh, I don't know why she had to be there. I mean, she's still best girl. I'm not upset that she's there, but I just don't understand why she had to be added to the chapter two. If they were going to go to the the point of adding, because it comes up later because Furuhashi shows up too. And if they were going to go to that point, then they might as well have added Sekijo as well. Just bring in all the girls at that point, because why not? Uh, it feels a little weird having just four out of the five there. But regardless, he helps Kurisu get the strap. He gets out of there before he sees anything. And then Furuhashi comes in. Uh, comedic timing, of course. Furuhashi reveals that she's an A-cup. 
right as the boss shows back up and helps you get out of the outfit. So then Yuiga takes her out to ice cream. It's a weird chapter. It's a weird chapter that I don't really have a problem with because, hey, it's a comedy series. Hey, it's a harem series. It's a slice of life. It's a fun time where crazy coincidences happen. And it's still not as bad as a lot of them that I've seen in other shows. There's no situation here where he falls into the girl's breasts or where one of them trips over him and their skirt goes up. But at the same time, it just feels a little weird. There's never... When Kurisu shows up, I wasn't going, oh, of course she's here. Like We Never Learn normally does for me. Like last chapter, where Ogata showed up at Kurisu's place when she ordered uh, udon. Oh, of course it's Ogata. Ogata delivers udon. And so it's just like, I don't know. This, this is a middle-of-the-road chapter for me. I didn't hate it. I actually enjoyed a lot of it. But I still find it completely ridiculous, the situations he gets into. And maybe that's the point. Maybe I'm not supposed to think about it as much as I do. Hunter Hunter 369. It's been 18 hours. We've been on this boat for 18 hours. How? It's crazy to me that that's the only amount of time that's passed. And Emperor Time's been active for nine hours. It's like, oh man, Karapika is just dying. Remember, for every second that Emperor Time is active, Karapika loses a year of his life. Or an hour of his life, I'm sorry. For every second that's active, he loses an hour of his life. Like, at nine hours, that's a lot of seconds. That's, that's more math than I wanted to do on the top of my head. That's a lot of time. Uh, and on top of all that, Oita is starting to lose her trust in him. Wobble has his back. Little baby Prince Wobble has his back, grabs his hand, uh, and wins her back over to his side. But come on, lady, like, Karabik is doing his best here, trying to keep you and your baby alive. Uh, we still don't know what's going on with, uh, Sarid and that whole situation, if she's still alive with Sarid, or if he had the Nin Beast eater. Uh, but we do know that Sarid's Nin Beast can eat the cockroach, and does, and that finally deactivates Emperor Time. Thank goodness. Um... You, you have this big scene where everybody gets introduced from all these different princes that are here to learn Nen. And I almost feel like with that scene, we could have gotten rid of the scene like two chapters ago where we got a cut to each of them. Because we had the cut originally where we went to each of them. Then we had the cut where we went back to each of them where we found out about all their Nen beasts. Then we had the cut like two chapters ago where we went back to all of them again to talk about how they all had these different guards, and now finally we had the cut of each of the different guards. I don't know, it, just, it feels like we're cutting all these names a little too much. Like, I got lost reading them. I was like, okay, so this is the Ninth Prince, and this is the Eleventh, and I just need to go back over it, I guess. I just need to reread, reread the entire arc leading up here, but man, it's a lot of people that Karapika has to teach in two weeks. And Oito wants to learn, too, and I thought that was a really nice touch for her, that she's willing to... I know she's scared. She's absolutely scared. But she's willing to go this extra, like, mile, basically, to help protect Wobble. And Krabik is like, hey, <laughs> about that. See, the thing is, you remember when I gave you a dolphin that had a Nen ability? Uh, that, you know Nen now. Because that's the side effect. It forces you to awaken your Nen. So, yeah. I hope you're okay with that. And of course she is, because she wanted to learn it anyway. Um, but still, it, it's a little crazy that he never mentioned that earlier. I guess he didn't really have a choice. I mean, what are you going to do? you got to do something. You're giving up lifespan every second. So, very excited to see where that goes. I really hope we don't get bogged down in a training arc, but at the same time, I don't really want us to time skip either these two weeks, because I feel like there's a lot of interesting things going on, especially with the guard that knows that there's other people that can use Ned. And then the attendant that looks like a robot. Very excited to find out what happens there. My Hero Academia 150. So Mirio is in trouble. Uh, so Sakaki and Nomoto have two really cool quirks that on their own would never work together. But together work really well. I think I said on their own would never work together. That doesn't make sense. Point is, on their own, they're not that useful against Mirio. The confession power is really cool, but if you don't have the slosh to be able to slow him down, he's just going to go around you or punch you or something. 
the the way those two teamed up is really powerful, and I, I especially love the confession quirk. The ability to make people realize what's in the deep, like, dark part of their heart because they have to tell the truth, and they know they're telling the truth. That's super cool. I love that. I hate that it, you know, is going to be completely forgotten after this arc, probably, this guy with his cool quirk. Um, especially because Mirio beats him this chapter. Uh, however, Mirio saying that it won't work on him because he already accepts his own weakness because being weak is a part of him. It's like, this is why Night Eye wanted him to replace All Might. Hands down, this is why. Uh, there's nobody better personality-wise than Mirio, clearly. Uh, now, obviously, we all want Deku to replace All Might, and he's going to because he has all for one, or one for all. But this is why Night Eye was raising Mirio to be the choice. The fact that he's just over here like, yeah, no, my weakness is a part of me. It's a problem. I know. But I've accepted it so I can fight. And just, man, just, oh, he gives up a chance to get a good, solid one-two combo on overall so that he can phase a kick with permeation right through Ares' face to kick the guy holding her and then bounces back and catches her. And she's like, no, you got to go. You got to get out of here. You got to leave. He's going to kill you. And he's like, no, I'm going to protect you. I can be your hero. Because he does hate that he left her before. He realized if he just saved her before, they'd have saved him so much trouble and she wouldn't have had to keep suffering. But he accepts that he made a mistake and he's moving on with him. I love that about him. And I'm really afraid he's going to die. I'm really afraid he's going to die. I actually think we might see his death as early as next chapter. Though I expect we might get a little bit of a flashback chapter and then see him die two or three chapters from now. Uh, specifically, I felt like Mirio was probably going to die for a while because Sundowner relies on that friendship between him and Mirio. And as long as it's there, his character arc will only be, I'm tough because I want to be tough for him. And if Mirio dies, his character suddenly becomes so much more interesting. Don't get me wrong, I love Sundowner. I think Sundowner's a great character already. Uh, I feel like even without Mirio's death, he could still become a great hero. But I feel like with his death, he'd become so much better. And that's just the Gundam fan in me sitting here going, yeah, sometimes you got to kill off that character so that another character rises up in their place. <laughs> Speaking of character death, The Promised Neverland 52. Sanju versus the Demons. And man, does Sanju look cool. Just holding that spear and doing that kick. I love Sanji the first time we met him, but I felt like he was a bad guy. Now we know he's technically not a bad guy, but he wants to eat humans. And he is going to every length he needs to. Obviously also to protect Mujica and himself. It's not just out of his desire to eat humans, but a lot of that's a part of it. And I really expect that Sanji's dead. Uh, he just waltzes through those regular demons, basically. But then he's up against the boss. And uh, the boss demon there is like, hey, got my big sword. Standing off against you. This is going to be a really cool fight that none of the fans are ever going to get to see. And I guarantee you Sanju's dead. Hands down, Sanju's dead. There's no way. There's no way he lives through this guy. Because there's no way this guy gets off, off screen. Like, the only way Sanju lives is if they fight to a draw and the ground breaks under them or something. And they get separated. Because as long as these two go up against each other, it's over. There's hands down. Sanju cannot beat this guy because this guy's a bad guy and he, we don't know his name yet. And he's the cool bad guy that does cool things like cutting trees in half. And as cool as Sanju is, good guy will never win against cool bad guy that does cool things so we don't know his name yet. Because he can't die till we know his name. That's just the way manga is. That's just the way anything is. Except for Unicorn Gumball. Because that was a good guy. Point is, Sanju's definitely dead. Uh, which is a shame, because I really liked his character, but I guess he's completed his arc, so there's not really any need for him to be around anymore. I was kind of hoping he'd show back up again toward the end to help him, but it's what it is. And he could still, I guess, if that whole cliff collapsing thing happens, forest collapsing thing, whatever. That's not the point of the chapter, though. That was sick and a great start to the chapter, but that's not the point of the chapter. Because the kids are immediately upset that Minerva's not there. Uh, they start calling him a liar. And Ray is fine, like, you guys done? You good? Like, yeah, I guess we're fine. Um, 
Uh, Ray pulls out the pen again, talks about how he played with it before and they got stuck and couldn't get through all the password lock uh, because it just wouldn't progress. Now thinks that because we're here, maybe it will let them progress, and it does. And they unlock a shelter, or they unlock a hatch that leads to a shelter. And there's a guy in the back. Should he be Mr. Minerva? So this guy's actually pretty cool. He's like a little reclined back with his feet on the desk. He's got cookies, and he's got a coffee mug, and I don't know what his deal is yet, but I'm super excited to find out. Very, very hype for next chapter. I think we might get some more lore dumps. For sure, for sure. We ended out this week with One Punch Man 74. So Iryu tries to reason with Bakuzan. He absolutely tries. Uh, doesn't work out very well, to be honest. He's beaten. He's done. He's, it's over for Suiryu. He's got nothing left. He's he's devastated. And Bakuzan's like, hey, I'll, I'll spare you if you lick my toe. And Suiryu breaks his toe. And then calls out for help. He's like, he won't bow down, but he's completely beaten. This is the guy who said that there was no need for heroes. The heroes were worthless. And we get this cut of while he's calling out for the heroes to, to please come help him. There's a monster here. Please come help me. We get a shot of all the other heroes busy fighting. And a lot of them are hurt because these are monsters they're fighting. And these are tough monsters they're fighting. And you come back to Sui Ryu. And he looks over and he sees Snack and Max on the ground. And it hits you. Now he understands why these people are heroes. Because they want to protect people from feeling just like he feels now. And he's begging them to get up. Even for a second. Just one second. Even if they don't stay up. Just get up for a second. Please help me. Please. And Bakizan raises his foot to crush Snack. And he brings the foot down, and the look on Suiryu's face, he's a broken man. It's, there's nothing left. It's over. For just one last second, he wanted to be able to rely on heroes. But there were no heroes to save him. And Bakuzan picks up his foot. His next body's not there. And I was like, here we go! Here we go! Because the next thing we see is Saitama setting Snack down. And Bakuzan's like, who are you? And Saitama's like, I'm a hero. He tells Sui Ryu that he heard his cries for help. Tells him to leave the rest to him, that he did a good job so far, but he got this now. And Saitama moves into frame, and it's like, oh man, next chapter is going to be hype! Because Saitama's going to wreck Bakuzan, and then I want him to go after Gokatsu. And then he needs to go rescue all the other heroes, because I saw a licenseless rider out there. I saw uh, Fubuki. There's a lot of people needing help. And he's the only one left that can help him, because everybody else is busy. I loved this chapter. Everything to do with Sweeveryu breaking... Realizing that this is what a hero is about. But that even then it doesn't matter if there's nobody around to save people. Only for Saitama to come in and save them. And say that it took so long because he was changing. Yeah. That's, that's, that's perfect. That's exactly Saitama. That's who he is. And so we were you the, the hope on his face. It was amazing. It's so well drawn every week. Murata does such a good job drawing it. and This week was no exception. Just great chapter. Great chapter. All right, well, we reached the end of our show. I am losing my voice, so it's a good thing we just finished up. <clears throat> TLDW. The rapid fire review section. Food Wars 228. Really solid chapter. Really wish we got more about Magishima. Well, good job. Enjoyed it. Looking forward to next week. Loved the stuff with Yukihira and Tsukasa. Dr. Stone 24. Everything to do with Gen is great. The fact that he's a magician, that he's doing all these tricks, that he's trying to choose a side. Uh, the fact that Senku was able to finally get him over to his side at the end of the chapter by promising power. Really good. Loved it. Uh, One Piece 876. Big Mom Street Shark. Pudding. Sundere. 
uh, Brooke being awesome with Chopper. Zeus might still betray. Kind of curious, a little concerned. So I'm just going to make a cake. Good chapter. Loved it. Robot Laser Beam 22. Risky Business. Wedge Wizard. Ultramarine Droplet. Great chapter. Looking forward to next week. Black Clover 122. Really solid. Love some of the character moments. Uh, there were a couple things that I wasn't super hype about, but I really enjoyed it. It was good. We Never Learned 28. Ridiculous premise. 100% ridiculous premise. Enjoyed the chapter. Uh, there wasn't a lot of fan service, actually. I expected there to be more. Uh, I was happy to see that there was not, personally. Uh, it is a great chapter. If you're looking for fan service, you still get to see Best Girl, and you still get to see Best Girl mostly naked. So, hey, that's all you care about. You're good. Solid chapter, despite my complaints about the premise. Hunter Hunter 369, great chapter. Emperor Time's over for a little bit. Kropika gets to no longer be losing lifespan. Oito's learning Nen. There's a lot of stuff happening. Good chapter. My Hero Academia 150, Mirio, two thumbs up. Sakaki, Nomoto, two more thumbs up. That's four thumbs up. I only have two, so I can't hold up four at a time. The fight with Overhaul, that's another thumbs up. That makes five. Good job, My Hero Academia. Promise Neverland 52, great chapter. Sanju's definitely dead. Calling it now. If he comes back, I still called it. So, ha! Really solid chapter. Looking forward to seeing who this guy is. Calling it now, he's definitely not Minerva. One Punch Man 74. One of the best chapters of One Punch Man I've ever seen. Sui Ryu and everything to do with him is great. Absolutely loved it here. Uh, the breaking of a man only for him to be built back up at the end. The moment where he begs Max or Snack to stand back up. Absolutely great. Really, really good look into the human side of the story. And not just the hero and monster side. Wonderful chapter. And that means that... On the whole, this was a great chapter, or a great issue of Jump. Hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I did. If you have some comments to make, some complaints to make, uh, please put them in the comment section below or send them to us at the Full Spectrum Podcast at gmail.com. We are back Thursday with another podcast, although there is a hurricane coming in, so podcast might get delayed. I hope not. We'll find out. Hopefully we can get this camera sorted out with the glare sorted out. There it is. The perfect glare. Uh... But we'll be back next time. Thank you very much for watching. And remember to always enjoy the full spectrum that Jump has to offer.